I I love the question, and it's it's you're right spot on. By the way, I think you you really touched upon something really really important, and that is, you know, we we actually we understand a lot of these biological systems really insularly, right? So one one parcel at a time, one piece at a time, and we, you know, we really don't look at these as a as an integrated system. And the reason why we don't do that is because we don't have these kind of models. If you think about the spider web, it's made from all these individual atoms. It truly depends on how these atoms can interact. And, and if, you, if you ignore these interactions, you're not going to be able to build a predictive model of the spider web because simple proof of that is basically you take a single mutation in the silk sequence, and you're going to get a very different response of the, of the spider silk you make, right? So, so there's a very, very strong nano to macro relationship. And if you take a continuum approach, you're going to ignore all these things, right? So it's true for any material, but especially true for living organisms. So there's a lot of singularities built in there that essentially mean you have an infinitely small building block, can you kind of move around in the space of information? I'm absolutely fascinated by this. You know, I, I um, yeah, and, and this, this, this is one of those kind of questions that we're going to have to solve is how do we, how do we go from isolating the, uh, the sound of a spider web to visuals? How do we integrate these? They are related. And, and when you integrate this in, in a model, you're going to have a much more powerful understanding that's that's much more comprehensive. So that's kind of like where I'm going with a lot of the work I do is kind of moving into that, into that field, yeah. Thank you for hosted, hosting this um, amazing podcast and having me again. It's, it was really fun last time, so I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, so what I do, I mean, I'm, I'm a materials scientist. I'm a modeler, but I also make materials, and I'm particularly interested in biological materials. And the one that I think we'll be talking about today is um, uh, are spider silks and spider webs, but we do work on a lot of different kinds of biological materials and kind of interested in how nature produces through mainly living organisms materials and how we can understand them as engineers as scientists and how we can use some of the insights we can learn of course and um, maybe building better materials ourselves as engineers um, how do we translate that and the other thing that i always say when people ask me how do you define yourself is i, I study failure so i study how what happens to a material when you really push it to the extreme right? extreme pressure extreme temperature um, usually these are the factors of what happens if you, if you want to break a material or what it happens if it, when, or when it breaks and what are the underlying mechanisms going on in the material then. So I want to go back for the, the starting of the spider web structures. I think that's more than 10 years ago we have been doing that. But can you tell me why did you become interested in the spider web structure and material? Can you tell me where it all started from just to work now i think more than one decade here yeah yeah so well it started really i mean you can sort of the different ways to explaining it but i i can tell you maybe can go back a little bit longer and explain really more the background in this so i i was really intrigued by modeling materials and designing materials atom by atom so that's something i learned during my phd and during my postdoc and i i was trying to look for ways as a theoretician as a simulation person i was trying to look for ways and understanding how do we of course, model these materials, but how do we make them ultimately? And I, I learned this again during my PhD in my time at my postdoc that it's it's really important to have experimental validation of the work you do, of course. And and I've been very lucky to being able to work with very good experimentalists during my PhD and and later on. But when I when I started my faculty here, faculty job here at MIT, I I was moving into the field of um, organic materials, living materials, and I was really becoming interested in in these really complex protein-based materials. And one of, the, one of the reasons why this became so interesting for me is because, um, first of all, they're really what drives all of living, or most of living systems in, in, in here on this planet. And they're you know, everywhere in your, in your cells and in spider webs and in skin and hair, in, you know, in viruses, everything's made out of these proteins. But most importantly, this is the answer to your question, um, you can make them experimentally with very high precision, right? So we're always struggling as engineers to make nanomaterials. Like if you want to make a graphene structure or maybe a particular molecule, it's very hard to do. But in the protein world, you really have access to the machinery that nature provides, essentially 
I wouldn't say for free, but yeah, kind of for free. We, we get it by observing nature, right? We can get access to this beautiful machinery. And within this world, of course, I'm a material scientist, so I'm really interested in, 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 in kind of not necessarily just the living organism, but the actual material that makes up the organism. And so to me then, in this protein world, of all the different options you have, you know, everything from cells to viruses to tissues, well, to me, materials like silk are, are one of the most fascinating ones because they have high strength, toughness. You know, even if you compare them to engineered materials like steel or Kevlar or maybe, you know, synthetic fibers, they are almost as good and sometimes better than these materials, right? So, so they are kind of a, a great prototype. You know, as a scientist, I'm going to look for things that I that I can, like I said, experimentally validate, I can make in the lab, I can study, I can simulate, but I also need good benchmarks. And so if you have, um, if you want to study how biology makes amazing materials, uh, you know, silk obviously is one of the natural choices because of its performance. It's basically, yeah, it competes very well, or even some people say it's better than, than engineered materials. That's sort of where I came from. The other reason, and that's the easier answer that I usually give and I don't have as much time, is, is silk is actually, a, it's, it's a fairly, it's very complex, yes, but it's, easier to study simpler in its makeup than if you were to study, yeah, let's say a living cell, okay, because it's a it's a repeat protein, it's a lot of, there's a lot of pattern in there, um, so it's a lot more like an engineered material, if, if you wish, than let's say, yeah, living in a living cell, which is a whole lot more complex, so so that makes it a little bit easier and more tangible. Um, it's still really difficult, in fact, I, I, you know, this community is you know, intensely studying silk, and 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 um, and we still know very little about it, actually. But, but yeah, compared to many other materials, it's very it's 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 easier and it's easier to study and comprehend. And and for us being able to, I'm really really interested in the in the connection between the model and the experiment. And silk is one of those cases, I think, where we could, we're going to have a chance to actually make this connection very rigorously, as opposed to many other systems where this would be. Um, impossible, maybe just a very long time in the future. So those are some of the reasons. So it really is pragmatic, but also intriguing and uh, and really a really great, great state. And and of course, maybe, you know, of course, spider webs are really beautiful structures and, and amazing constructs that if you think about it, how are they made? And I think we'll probably talk about this later. It's, it's a mystery and everyone sees them um, yet um, you really can't really get your hand around it. How do spiders make these structures and how do we how do we visualize them? Actually, it's not it's not easy. Excellent. Maybe I want to go for this question. There are more than forty five thousand, I think, species of spider. And may I ask you what kind of? Yeah, because you have been doing this for more than a decade, I think. Uh, what kind of spider that intrigued you the most in the both in the in the structure the design? Maybe that's the first part. Yeah, so I mean, we're pretty. I'm personally pretty agnostic to that. To be honest, I don't have a favorite species, but um, we have been, um, you know, we have we're doing experimental work on that as well, and as we've seen in a recent paper. Um, and you know, I think the the kinds of spiders we've been really fascinated with the species are the ones that are build that build interesting webs. So in the in the early days of my work, uh, we basically studied these two dimensional orb webs, but and you know, kind of through the spider web, you imagine when you when you think about a spider web, this is the what we call an orb web with the spiral and the and the and the read alphabets. Um, but in the last yeah ten years or so, we've been very heavily into three dimensional web structures, and so we've been looking for species essentially that built these much more complicated tangled webs, cob webs, funnel webs, and and there's a whole world of species out there that and mainly this is mainly credit to my collaborators who helped me identify as identify what these species are, but. Um, those are the ones we, we we pick essentially, you know, that build interesting webs, and then we um, we we study them. Now, because there are so many, um, one of the things that's really hard to do is to study all of them, and that's something I would love to do. But experimentally, it's very hard, right? Because um, you know, studying a single species uh, will take weeks and weeks if you're lucky to build a web and scan the web, digitize the web. So doing this for, you know, thousands of web structures is just not feasible. So I think, well, there's a compromise there. So yeah, we pick interesting spider species that make, that we can grow, I mean, that grow locally here in, in the lab, right? So that's an issue as well. Um, we can get access to, you know, we're going to be able to, to buy them um, and, you know, feed them and make sure they 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 do well and and then build webs. And so there's a lot of, you know, biological living living things that don't listen to us are very hard to to work with because they they're gonna do whatever they want to do. You know, they don't they don't listen to the lab 
they don't, they don't listen to the grad students or anyone. Um, so there's a lot of these kind of parameters as well. So you have to pick things that are that work well, but but give you the kinds of detail and structure and complexity that we want. Mm -hmm. Maybe I want to ask you about what are the mysterious things that you still yeah, maybe not answered or maybe in the research. Because you mentioned at the beginning why you were intrigued in the spine in the first place, but I'm just curious about the mysterious things, like you know, maybe the structure, material, maybe something to answer regarding evolution, why they build this way. Can you tell me about the questions or the things we left seems mysterious still in the spiders, as well structure, material-wise? What are these things that mysterious? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of mysterious things. I mean, you can start by um, just looking at the sequence. I mean, we have this um, the silk sequence basically encoded, you know, in the spider's genome, right? And, and there's a lot of these um, the patterns in there that we understand a little bit about, but there are a lot of things in this at that level we don't understand, right? So it's sort of a very long list of letters that the spider has, and, and we don't know, to answer the mystery, you know, which of these letters are really important. We know some of them that are important, but we have a lot of information in there, and we have no idea whether they're important or not. So that's important if you want to understand the biology, but also if you want to engineer these silks in the lab synthetically. So there's a lot of these at that level. And then there's a lot of behavioral level as well. I mean, that's one of the things that I, that's, again, hard to study experimentally because let's say you want to look at how, how is the web geometry affected by whether the spider is hungry or fed, right? Whether the temperature is high or low, whether there's wind in the room and, or in the environment. So a lot of, in, you know, environmental cues like this that are very hard to study because it's very difficult to repeat these experiments um, under these different conditions. It takes a long time and... And again, spiders aren't always making a web when we want them to make a web. So there's a lot of these practical challenges, I think. And I'm mainly a computational person. And, you know, we, we work on these experimental studies and, and many other things as well experimentally. But um, it is, particularly with these living organisms, it's very difficult to, um, to, to parameterize some of those things that if you ask people, right, you know, what would you like to study? Is the web going to look different when the spider is hungry or if there's another spider in the area? Uh, those are things that I we don't really fully understand yet. I mean, hopefully one day we'll be able to do that, but it's difficult to do um, some of those, you know, variations of conditions. Can you give a good example how the spider, like being hungry, for example, this affect the spider web? You know that if there is a a prey, just to eat, you they won't catch it. But can you tell me how if they hungry is they build but weaker structure? How this is affect the building of the structures or the producing of the silk? Well, I mean. When the, the spider web is and serves a lot of different purposes, one of them is prey catching, but there are other reasons why the spider builds webs. You know, they 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 live in there. Some spider species have, you know, put the eggs in there and, and they um, you know, have some species have colonies where multiple spiders work together and building kind of a collection of webs. So there's a lot of different functions of webs um beyond prey catching, but but prey catching is definitely one of them that is, you know, used by but many different kinds of webs, and you see that, right? And you go out in nature and take a walk, and you look outside, and you see there's a fly in there, and then the spider will catch the fly and eat it. Um, so that's a very natural um, kind of mechanism. But um, the the spider web is, um, you know, surprisingly resilient to a lot of these perturbations. So if you think about a spider web um, being a very, it's a very soft structure, of course, but it's very resilient in terms of the forces that act on it. I mean, you can you can blow wind on it, you can have you know, a big fly in it and struggling for its life, you know, and and the spider will fight with it. I mean, you see that sometimes, but um, the the web structure is pretty resilient to all of these deformations. And and of course, the spider can repair that. And that's one of the really, many, one of the many fascinating things is the spider because it's like a living, um, it's a living material where an actual organism is, you know, lives inside the web or interacts with the web and can actually repair the web and interact with it in a way that, um, you know, is a little bit different than, let's say, um, tissues in humans because we're a bunch of cells, but we can't really observe the cells easily, at least with our eyes. But the spiders are discrete 3D printing objects that are moving around in space. They can be tracked. We can follow them more closely. And I think last time we talked about that paper we had on on the construction of webs, right, at that time. And so um, there's, there's a lot of things we can do with spider webs that are 
much more difficult to do in a in a yeah in a biological tissue because it's the the visualization the imaging is more difficult in 3D. Whereas in the spider web we have a discrete truss structure and we have a discrete object that's building the web, which we can interact with as scientists much more easily. Maybe I want to touch the first part about the structure or the mechanics of the web here. Because I, I saw a lot of papers actually just discussing about the possibility of inspiration from the spider web structure. Especially in soft robotics, when I see like sensor design, in inspiration for the design, more or less linear structure. But the spider, can you correct me, more linear and non-linear, the spiral part. Can you tell me about the combination of the, have the radial and the spiral for people listening? Why it's so relevant? If, the, if I remember, they go around building the radial and then the spirals. Can you tell me about the reason behind the combination? Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting question. Yeah, so I think the the well, what we found is that the these spider silks have different mechanical signatures. So they're kind of cables, but they when you pull them apart, right, they they respond very differently to this mechanical loading. You know, some of those threads are going to be very rigid and very strong. Um, and usually those are the ones that can hold up the structure, the radial threads that are very stable and robust. And then you have other spider silks that are um, deposited by the spider that are very soft and extensible. And they are also coated with a sticky you know, kind of glue on the outside, which makes, well, insects stick to them very easily. So there's different roles these play. And, and if, you, if you think about the web structure, um, when, you, when you pull the a thread and you try to kind of destroy the web at the level of an individual thread or wind is loading the web. Um, these nonlinearities that come about because you have these different material laws essentially uh, play a really important role in deciding um, what the web integrity is. And we found there's a lot of resilience because of these nonlinearities. And that's something that can be explained in a you know, following way. When you are um, when you're an engineer and you make a material, what you want is a lot of time, most of the time you want toughness, right? So you want material that's very tough. And how do you get toughness? Well, you get it by essentially engineering a, a what we call a softening plasticity behavior. In other words, you pull a material, like a metal is a great example for this, and instead of it becoming more rigid, it becomes softer. And it, as it becomes softer, it creates, it dissipates energy through this process to, you know, mechanisms like dislocation motion or plasticity or maybe diffusion or some sort of, um, well, some sort of dissipation that takes the elastic energy and makes it into heat. Um, in, a, in a spider web, actually, you, you want the opposite. And that's maybe counterintuitive at the beginning, but what you really want if you, and if you want, if you want to have, um, I should probably explain a little more on the toughness. So when you have a tough material, the way you create toughness is by dissipating energy. And you do this by, by, dissipating energy in a large volume of your material. You sacrifice a lot of part of your solid and you create plasticity in it. That happens in a metal. But in a spider web, this would not be a good idea because now you're basically destroying, you're, you're, you're permanently changing a lot, large part of the structure. So what the spider really does is sort of engineers these different material behaviors such that you create the opposite effect, actually. And so when you when you have a, what we call hyperelastic stiffening effect, you, you essentially, as you pull this material, instead of becoming softer, becomes more rigid. Um, and when you do that, and, and this is what theory can show, so continuum mechanics theory can show you that when you do that, actually, you you create an a even stronger concentration of forces in a low, in a small area. And now, again, in a real material that you want to build a, you know, maybe a, a wall out of or ceiling or in a building or an airplane hull, you don't want that because you want the material to be very tough and, and, and strong. Uh, you want the damage to spread out you, rather than localize, like in glass, right? But in a, but in a spider web, because you have these stiffening effects, um, you actually localize damage. And so when you when you do pull on a thread, you end up sacrificing just that thread instead of sacrificing a larger portion of the web. And that's really the uh, the key the key result here that makes it such that if you if you have resiliency through this mechanism, you you can sacrifice a couple of these individual filaments but you won't sacrifice the entire web or a large section of the web. And that's what um, the spider, of course, can repair that very easily. That's a spider will just go in and put a new thread in there if the spider wants. Interesting. So this is kind of redundancy, you mean? Redundancy in the design. Yeah, the design, but it's, it's really created through an interplay of both geometry, meaning you have a mesh structure, and you have it as, as a by design of a material. That's one of the things that I'm really fascinated by generally in, in, in materials design or modeling is that 
you you can create different functions by changing either the material, right? Or you can change them the structure of the material. And of course in biology, we do both at the same time. Engineers usually don't do that. I mean we, we either make a we pick a metal, we pick a ceramic, we pick polymers, right, to make something. Uh, we don't really ask the question, well, if I want a certain function, let's design the material and the structure at the same time. We don't do that usually. Um, nature does all the time. And that's really what happens here. I mean, you have silks, different kinds of silks that are kind of engineered through evolutionary mechanisms over, you know, long time, hundreds of millions of years, billions of years. Um, while we're optimizing the structure, the spider builds a certain geometry out of a certain material. They both evolve. We just talked about different species, right? So different species are going to make different webs because of evolutionary pressures. So when you when you think about this more globally in a longer time scale, which we, we like to do, you know, we like to think about spiders not as a, like we, we look at it as a snapshot today, but really they are organisms that have evolved over yeah billions of years. So they're gonna um, they're gonna you know present some sort of history in 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 chain that we can study as well. And yeah, when you do that, I mean, you're gonna see that. There's these these this merger of material and structure that is something, and I think you mentioned robotics. Um, you know, in robotics, that's something that I think a lot of people are thinking about as well, right? So you want to think about how do you make a better material, but also you want to adapt the structure and the shape. And and this is how we're different now as engineers than maybe five or ten years or twenty hundred years ago, where we we kind of picked the material or we had a certain thing in mind we want to build, and then you 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 choose the material, right? To, to make that, um, whereas now we, with these computation algorithms we're beginning to develop, um, you know, you tell me what you want and I'll tell you the material, the, the design, the structure at different length scales and time scales, and you get a certain function. So we're really designing for function as opposed to designing, you know, in piecemeal. And of course, that's what nature does. And the reason why we're so intrigued by that is, is that um, there's a really interesting science behind it, but also as engineers, you can achieve a lot more functionality out of a lot less if you do that. And so that means savings in material, savings in cost, savings in you know carbon footprint, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of savings you can um, you can achieve by, by doing that, yeah. These were a really excellent point. Uh, there was a lot of question here, but maybe the first one for, because you mentioned the part of be counterintuitive that you stress localization at one point and sacrifice the strength of the spider web, which is, I think, different what we do in software robotics in general. I want to ask you when the spider web completely fail, when it's a condition that it could fail completely. Well, they are, you know, the spider web, you know, it actually will fail a lot. I mean, a lot of times. And if you look at a web after a few days, you know, it will have failed. And you can see, you know, the odd nature. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of situations when this happens. I mean, it could be, you know, rain. It could be, you know, a twig being blown on the, on the on the structure. It could be it could be a predator that, um, you know, sometimes spiders will eat their own web because essentially they they feed on the protein. Um, so that is, um, you know, interesting question. I mean, it's built into the mechanism of of nature that you 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 create a structure and it's being recycled essentially in some way or form. You know, a lot of times. So so that happens a lot. I think it's not like it doesn't happen. Which is why I think for you know for engineers we if we want to build something out of a out of something like a spider web, conceptually you you have to do some work, right? Because it's not enough to just copy the spider web, you know. And and, and of course you can't make um, I mean it wouldn't make any sense to build a a bridge out of a spider silk material because it would it would essentially not be very robust. So, um. What we we gonna have to do? I mean, intellectually, as engineers, if we want to like learn from nature and the things we've talked about, you you want to kind of translate these mechanisms, the things we really are are are, are you know impressed by nature and that nature does really well, which is resilience and maybe built-in failure tolerance and things like this. And we're gonna have to translate this into engineering solutions, and there are gonna be different constraints we have, right? I mean, as engineers, as engineers, you, you, yeah, we we can't build a new structure every few days. <laughs> Um, we're going to have to use probably not silk. We have to use other maybe polymer materials and maybe some other um, maybe steel cables. But but there are certain elements in the design that we could mimic that, of course, biology does really well. And and one of them is this merger of structure and material, which we we aren't really exploring yet. So there's different levels in what we call bioinspiration. I think I would say historically, bioinspiration is basically just copying nature. 
Um, we're far beyond that now. We're really looking at understanding principles for which nature works and then translating these principles into engineering solutions. And that is probably what I'm most excited about. So so I always have to explain that because, yeah, when people think about bioinspiration, they think, yeah, you just got to copy nature. But it's not just that. It's really much deeper. And we want to copy some of the mechanisms or mimic some of the mechanisms and, and utilize them to achieve superior engineering functionality. And that usually involves multifunctionality. Um, you know, I don't know in robotics, you know, being able to actuate and sense at the same time, for example, there are a lot of mechanisms that are built into a biology that we don't even know about a lot of times. You know, we study a spider species or any other creature and we find out, yeah, this is actually a really strong material, but it also is a sensor, right? Or is a, or it has actuation capacity. And, and you, you don't really see that in the beginning. And then unless you study it, you begin to see there's a lot of different dimensions to this seemingly simple material. And that's, you know, for silk is kind of what I had said in the introduction. I think, uh, I think we want to pick things that are tractable, right? Because if we pick a system that is so complex that we have no way of actually breaking it down into the engineering principles or building a model of it, um, it's got to be almost impossible to really engineer, translate this to engineering. So we're going to have to think about the, you know, I'm very pragmatic. So yeah, we, we're going to study something with the objective of, of translating to engineering. We have to have a, a plan that actually can be implemented. And, and I think for spider webs, that is something you can see. Um, but yeah, but it's definitely not a one-to-one -one translation like your question uh, kind of led into. I think we, um, which makes it very interesting, actually. It's, it's not just simply copying it and, and drawing it and printing it. I mean, it's, it's really understanding the principles behind the construction and then going on and, and kind of applying that into solving problems that, that matter. Yeah, I want to go again for the point when you mentioned from the list we can make more functional. I think it's really more, yeah, more relevant point for discussion of robotic when design new material, actuation, sensor. And I want to ask you, do you think that, that, how do you think about the correlation about the material and, for example, the spider web structure? If we have different material, how different, the different material acting to the spider web structure? If there is a limitation, how the material the choice is here to the spider web structure or any, any structure, how do you see the correlation between material and morphology here? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, when, when you, when you look at, um, when you look at something like a, like a spider web, it, you know, it has a lot of built-in, um, you know, hidden functionality. And one, some of those functionalities come from the fact that you have these different, yeah, different types of silks we talked about earlier that are, you know, built into this composite structure. And what is challenging, though, and this is where a lot of the understanding, at least in my in my understanding, ends is 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 where where these what these functionalities are for. I mean, you know, you can ask the question. Yeah, like what's resilience, what's the strength, and we can measure these. But what I said earlier also is a lot of times we find that when you when you dig deeper, actually, you're going to see that there, there are adaptations in these designs that we haven't even understood the objective function for. Right? We don't know what this is actually for. Right? And so you have to really reverse engineer a lot of these systems. So in a, in a case like a spider web with these different silk threads and these different functionalities, uh, a lot of the research really has to be about figuring out what are the potential objective functions that that are actually being adapted for here, right? And then we don't, like I said, a lot of times we don't know that, and and that's a big challenge if you're looking at organisms that are that are poorly studied. And spiders definitely are, you know, they're they're studied well in some ex to some extent, but in reality, yeah, there there are not too many scientists in the world to be able to study spiders, and they're a lot more studying other things. Um, so it's it's kind of a small community and. Um, and, and there's a lot of unknowns just about how spiders live in the environment. I mean, obviously, it's very difficult to, to monitor them and, and visualize them and watch them. But, yeah, there's definitely, you know, a lot of opportunities. I mean, that's the main point I want to make is, is understanding what are they actually uh, trying to achieve through their designs. And, and, and unless we know that, of course, we really have very little. Um, as engineers, we, we have to know that. Otherwise, we, we're kind of blind, blindly looking for ideas you know we want to kind of understand um what are these what are these designs these these structures for and how do they function for the environment mm -hmm. let me ask you quickly why does a small community in the studying spider is it just something related to what are the challenges for that quickly um well i, I can't really and i mean i can't really answer this but i think that it's 
you know, like with a lot, a lot of areas of science, I mean, you have, um, you know, bigger and smaller areas, and I guess maybe it reflects the, the importance or the perceived importance of these, I think, uh, but I really can't, I mean, I can't really give an intelligent answer to this. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't make the choice for other people, <laughs> but I can say, I can say that, um, you know, I, I think that, I mean, spiders are intriguing, but there's clearly, if you're interested in, um, I mean, they're, they're really, right now, I mean, this is a lot of, this is really but fundamental scientific, you know, inquiry about either, you know, the fundamentals of engineering or the fundamentals of science. And, you know, if you're looking for, um, you know, solving uh, problems in disease treatment or there's a lot of other areas, I think, that require probably more people than, you know, studying how spiders build spider webs. I mean, there is a, it requires a certain personality of, of scientists that are really interested in, you know, maybe studying nature and asking very fundamental questions where we, like I said earlier, we don't even know the question to ask sometimes. And so, so, so it's a little bit of a, you know, niche area in that sense. But, I mean, it's a great community of people that are intrigued by that. And I think we all share the, you know, the passion around uh, nature, na natural materials, and ecosystems, and related questions. And and to me, I mean, like I said earlier, I mean, the, the fascinating thing is just with a very basic question of how, how these uh, you know amazing creatures build these absolutely amazing materials, and they're they're so tiny, and they they basically just eat. You know, I think we talked about it last time, but I mean, yeah, they eat they eat the food, flies, and and prey, and then they they make these absolutely incredible uh, structures. Which, with all the technology we have, we still cannot fully reproduce. Uh, the way the way spiders do it does do it. I mean, in nature, and it's it's sort of an enigma. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the in the spinning process that we don't understand. So there's just a you know enormous uh, universe of complexity out there, which I find just you know so startling in in a way sometimes. Right? Because we know so much about a lot of different things. It's, it's like you know people studying the oceans and they say, well, the ocean is very unexplored com compared to the I don't know space and that's kind of similar to that i mean you, you can see a lot of small universes of unknown features and unknowns and signs in a lot of different areas and spiders is one of them fascinate me for the reasons i talked about but um i think you know it's a it's an exciting field but i i, I think it's yeah there, there, there's many other important areas in science as well that we need to focus on um <laughs> including yeah like disease and um you know um, yeah. materials energy and you know the stuff like that so there's a um, there's a lot, large number of other problems, I think. So it's all good, but um, but yeah, it is it is an interesting area, and I, I think that if you, especially if you're getting into this, um, maybe maybe to, to answer your question, also one thought I have also is that, you know, I I'm a computational person. I li I like to study different things, and I study spider webs, but I also study, you know, keratins in hair and skin, and I study metals, ceramics, I love different things, and I can do that. I mean, I basically the whole point of my lab is to study how different materials get their functions because of different structures we talked about earlier and different um, architectures of these. And, and so for me, it's actually really important to study a lot of different materials. And I can do this because I study things at the molecular level and I and I can easily model spider silk this morning and in the afternoon I can study metals. And I use the same model essentially, which is a molecular dynamics approach or quantum mechanical model. And it's very flexible. But it, and here's the answer to the question maybe, if you're an experimentalist, you know, we have some labs here that I'm, you know, it's sort of fairly new in the last 10 years or so, but, you know, to, to do one type of experiment or one type of spider, uh, you need a, there's a long runway you need to actually get started, a lot of expenses. Um, so it's not easy for you to say, yeah, today I'm going to study spiders and tomorrow I'm going to study, I don't know, some worms and another day I'm studying maker. I mean, it's, you're going to have to invest in a certain direction. And maybe that's another reason why, I mean, you you start a lab, I mean, you're putting all your all your eggs in that basket, if you wish, not the spider basket. You're going to do that or not, or are you going to go with maybe what funding agencies want you to do, which is maybe, you know, yeah, build something or solve, make a new material. So it's a long-term investment, which perhaps is a little more difficult to do, especially experimentally. But again, for me, that's the whole point of my lab and the way I'm funded is usually we, we do a lot of comparative studies. You know, we, we actually make the point in studying how we can build better ceramics by learning from how, you know, ceramics in nature fail, right, and so on. So I think there's a lot of synergy there, but that's computational and not so much an experiment, perhaps. Maybe I want to go for two important, uh, I think, 
functionality here, maybe that's also related to soft robotics when we design materials, structure, but toughness and self-healing. I want to take your take first about self-healing, the state of self-healing, because there is different opinion, especially in the podcast when we discuss about self-healing. Some people agree or disagree about the the way we design self-healing in material. That's one aspect. And also achieving toughness should be toughness achieved on the inherent of the material. Or, for example, there's a spider using different classes of material in one structure or different structure to delay damage, for example. Yeah, no, I mean, self-healing is, uh, you know, by the way, a fascinating topic. I think, I think the, I, I think for spiders, self-healing ability really, you're going to see this at different scales, right? You see some self-healing mechanism at the molecular scale, which is what we've done back in, now, like 10 years ago or so. Um, on the on the you know the, the better sheet proteins and how the proteins actually interact and how basically there's a what we call stick slip motion so it's like a, a tape you know if you were to take a piece of paper and you were to stack it right and and you would you would pull it apart and it can kind of it's like a caterpillar it would like stick back again and that's a very sticky kind of motion uh, these proteins these better sheet proteins have that an intrinsic ability so they are self healing right at the molecular level. And, and that's something that you see in a lot of other materials. You don't see that. And the reason is, 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 is uh, the, you have defects, you have roughness, you really can't align the molecular structures. But in, in proteins, you can. There's a strong driving force, essentially, for proteins to assemble in the fold of geometry. Um, that is sort of something I would say self-healing, right? But it's a very, very tiny level. At a larger scale, the self-healing in spiders, you know, really comes from the living organism, as I said earlier, right? So, so you really think about the spider as an, e as it's an ecosystem. The spider lives in the web. Um, you know, the web breaks, right? The spider can go in and repair it. And, and it has the ability to sense, right? So you mentioned robotics, right? So he senses, okay, here's a, here's a damage. Um, and, and so now we're going we're gonna to do something about that. Or maybe there's prey here and, and so on. So... Spiders have the ability to orient themselves in the structure and interact with the structure and build it, right, and repair it. So there's that self-healing ability. I, th I think for we, when we talk about self-healing and engineering, I think your question was about that part as well, right? Now you're getting into, um, I, I think today, many times, and I would be careful here, but, you know, th these approaches are, are, are very different than what nature does a lot of times, right? So we, we basically have to engineer these things through built-in redundancies, which is what we're doing in, a, in an earthquake resistant building. You, know, you build in, basically things fail, you have backup, by the way, in the airplane, you have redundancies. Um, so that's one way of doing it. I think that's traditional what we do, but we really rarely um, see the system as a, you know, as something that can repair itself, right? Yeah, airplanes have to go to maintenance or your car has to go to maintenance and you fix it up and you can you know, um, do that. But it's a it's a very it's 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 a it's a system, but it's really it's kind of our way of mimicking the biological living organism. Whereas in in biology, this kind of failure, and you asked a very good question earlier about failure, right? And and it's built in, right? So it's expected that the spider will, will have a, a dam will have damage. It's expected that our 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 skin's gonna have scratch. We our bodies are made to deal with these damages and failures. Whereas in a lot of engineered systems, we have to do something special to fix them, and and I think that 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 um, you know in, intrinsic built-in ability to fix itself is something you were still struggling to really um, create as engineers from scratch, which is something I think we're all trying to do. But the approaches we've been trying so far, you know, are, are, are somewhat primitive compared to what nature does, of course, and there's a good reason for that. And one of the reasons is that. You know, it's hard to experiment with something like an airplane. You know, we don't want to build, and, and we've seen this whenever you new, use new materials in an airplane or in a car. An airplane is a good example, but um, you're going to have issues, and, and airplane manufacturers are working really hard to prevent these, but there's always issues. You know, new material, composites, you're going to see issues. Um, so, so there's a lot of, you know, people, are engineers, they don't want to take the risk good, for good reason, right? Um, so I think for us to kind of create these self-healing, systems, um, we're going to have to think more about the analogy of a living organism. And I think what robotics can do, actually, is to think about a system like that. I mean, you, you have, um, you know, the ability to um, you know, create um, um, a structure that can interact with itself, can measure the state of itself, can potentially repair itself or, or 
you know, in addition to doing the job that the robot's supposed to do, right, to actually, um, you know, do work on itself. And and that that direction, I think, is very exciting. And I don't really kind of work in that field, obviously, but um, I think it's a fascinating area. And I think folks doing this kind of work are are, are, are very important. I think the work they do is really important because that's that, I think, is the future. And if we embed this in the material itself, so if you, in my, in my dream world, when I dream about my future material, um, like, future composite, right? So I want to think about a composite that has the ability to sense. Um, it can act on itself. So if you if you sense damage, it's it's actually able to not only tell somebody, hey, here's a crack, which already would be great, but now, yeah, here's a crack, but I can now have some mechanism by which in a living organism, cells or spiders, you know, they, they can build roots, new filaments, but some mechanism where the composite could actually heal itself and and create new material and and that i think is the future it might be a little bit away from this but these kind of systems that have intelligence built in and i, I was mentioning earlier we look at spiders as a not as, as a snapshot in time but we really like to think about this these billions of years of evolution that the spider has had and we're trying to look at a spider today as part of a, a snapshot of some process that has started yeah a billion years ago and it's still ongoing right because it's still changing still adapting and, and I think if you think about materials in that way, um, you, you're going to create a future technology where I think it's like kind of like what I said earlier, that you have structure and material, which are distinct a lot of times. Maybe in the future we'll have that merged, but also have merged the idea of a robot. I mean, a robotic system is something we have today. We used to ask people, I mean, at least I'm naively thinking, you tell me robots, I think about something like in a factory or maybe in a, you know, at the doctor's office or maybe a future dentist, but, you know, would do surgery in your teeth, but but what what if this is a future robot is actually the material, right? And so you 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 say, okay, here's my my composite and my my or my structure, my car, and it's actually a living or whatever you define as living, but it's actually a thing that can respond and it can actually act on itself. It can it can grow new material. It can it can um, you know it can change its shape, its structure depending on the on the way it's used and. We might be a little bit away from this, but that's how I like to look at it. That's why I study these systems, because I'm really intrigued by this kind of all the features that living systems have that we don't quite have yet as engineers. And and I want to kind of push the envelope there and ask the questions, well, what do we what do we need to get there, right? And and how do we actually even think about this and how do we model this? And that's my specialty is modeling. So I'm interested in, well, how do we model a system like this? How do we actually create intelligence in a material itself. But so the material, someone has to be able to compute. It's not just enough to have the material sitting there. It needs a computer built in, right? It needs to have some sort of model built in itself that can become smarter as the material becomes older, basically, right? And as the material experiences different things, um, it's going to have to learn from the data it collects. And those are the kinds of things I like to say, you know, maybe look ahead, I don't know, 10, 20 years or maybe less, we don't know. Um, that I like to think about materials in that way. And so then the the question about robotics, materials, self-healing, they all kind of merge together. And, well, and that's not an invention that I had. I mean, this is what nature does. You just have to look outside in nature and you see this is how the entire living world is based upon these principles. We just, we're just rediscovering them in, in a way. But we can't, you know, we can't really claim ownership of them because it's, yeah, it's already been invented, right? We can just o open your eyes and you can see these, you know, amazing, amazing structures in 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 the living world that have actually achieved all of these feats already. This is already excellent point. I think there's maybe a couple of questions here I want to ask you. When you mentioned at the beginning, I think, about the, for example, how spider do that or other creature, it seems from my understanding we don't do the, exactly the same thing. It just, it's not the practical way, if I want to say it. It's just not the practical way to design it in material level. And when you mentioned that's the first part, and maybe I'm curious to ask you, do you think why we don't design this functionality like self-healing or whatever exactly as in, in the nature or the same way as it happened in nature because it seems i don't know if you agree or disagree it seems maybe it's not practical for users like that's the first part and do you think it's related to the modeling because you you focus on modeling do you think when you go to molecular level dynamic simulation for example do you think it's different from continuum level I, I don't know how do you see the differences here between the scale to understand what I need to embed in this material. Yeah. I I love the question and it's it's 
you're right spot on, by the way. I think you, you really touched upon something really, really important, and that is, you know, we, we actually, we understand a lot of these biological systems really insularly, right? So one, one parcel at a time, one piece at a time, and we, you know, we really don't look at these as, a, as an integrated system. And the reason why we don't do that is because we don't have these kind of models, right, a lot of times. I mean, our models are really based on modeling a particular type of thing, you know, behavior or maybe a particular type of structure. Um, and so that's why one of my jobs or my calling or my mission, my calling is not the right word, but my mission at least is to to advance the kind of the way we model these materials and, and to try to think about new ways because um, the way we've been modeling things by essentially, um, you know, creating, um, you know, thinking about a fundamental law that governs the equations, writing on the equation or governs the system and writing on the equation and using computers to solve them, um, it essentially assumes or requires you you really understand the system to some extent quite well and that you actually can derive these fundamental laws. But many um, highly complex biological systems or problems in that space that we talked about, we don't actually have this ability. In fact, um, we, we might not have the ability for a long time and, and or maybe never, I don't know. But so we're gonna have to think outside of the box. It's like, it's like I would say, you know, 100 years ago, you know, people did analytical Equations, that's all they could do. And then, and then people introduced computers. And I i wasn't alive then, but I'm pretty sure when they first came up with computers, people were saying, well, this is not real science, it's just a computer simulation. And probably I'm actually, I remember when, even when I was a PhD student and I started doing competition modeling of proteins, that was kind of, I went to a Gordon conference, I would go to Gordon conference on proteins, and I would be the only simulation person. And, and you know, it would be kind of an exotic thing. But now, because now you go to a biological, Gordon conference, a lot of people are doing computational modeling. It's become part of the repertoire of what we need to do to understand things. So, so I think we're kind of moving along in how we build better models. And for us, I mean, of course, this understanding complex systems requires, um, you know, new new modeling innovations. One of them in deep learning, AI based tools, language models, kind of tools we use a lot of times, which really um, allow us to 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 ask these questions like you raised. You know, well. How do we, how do we understand these biological systems in its integrated way, not just isolation, right, of, of a single thing, but actually how do we understand the system, and not just the system at a continuum level. So you're asking about that too, right? So continuum. It's actually that you know this is sort of um, we could probably now now I could talk about for like five hours on this, but I'm gonna have to keep it brief. But if you think about the spider web, it's made from all these individual atoms. It truly depends on how these atoms can interact. And and if you if you ignore these interactions, you're not going to be able to build a predictive model of the spider web because simple proof of that is basically you take a single mutation in the silk sequence, and you're going to get a very different response of the of the spider silk you make, right? So so there's a very very strong nano to macro relationship. And if you take a continuum approach, you're going to ignore all these things, right? So it's true for any material, but especially true for living organisms. So there's a lot of singularities built in there that essentially mean you have an infinitely small building block that has an infinitely big effect. And so when you ratio them out, of course, they have a finite effect. But um, if, you were to, if you were to average them out individually, you're going to lose the effect. And so, for example, if you were to you know, average out all the amino acid sequences, you're, you're not going to be able to predict these small differences because of individual amino acid substitutions or changes in the sequence. And um, and uh, conversely, you know, you won't be able to predict a, a predict create a bit predictive model of the system. So you really need to account for these. And and so when you do traditional modeling, either at the continuum scale or just at the molecular scale, you're gonna you're not gonna capture these cross scale relationships. But that's really what we need to do. And then we can begin to build these models that are much more of the of the system level. Okay. So here's the spider web. Here's the mechanisms. Once we do that, once we understand really the mechanisms at a much deeper level, how they all relate, like how does the sequence relate to the web geometry and how does this relate to the ecological niche the spider lives in, right? All of these questions, the kind of food, kind of prey the spider will has. We'll all, we integrate all of this. Then we can ask the question, how, do we, how would we translate this system behavior to something like, yeah, building a new, new composite material or maybe a new bridge design or robot, whatnot, and you can kind of see that that we just don't have that understanding right now, and and so my my mission, like I said, my 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 job in my lab here, my, my group, you know, that's what we're trying to figure out is how do we build these better models, 
that can actually capture these really, really vast cross-scale relationships. We call it metriomics. That's a study of those. And how do we how do we model these? How do, how do we measure them? How do we model them? And how do we make them predictive? Um, and how do we then build these? So, like I said at the very beginning, you know, we we're trying to make these materials as well, and 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 kind of uh, try to figure out not only theoretically, but well, how would you go about in actually producing something that can validate these predictions? And like I said in the beginning, this is what drew me to this field. Actually, is that I I can, you know, when I was um, when I was a postdoc at Caltech there were people there that were creating these artificial amino acids, um, Dave Terrell and others, and that really fascinated me because I could see, hey, I can engineer nature at this very basic level, use all the machinery, but I can actually also introduce new chemistry. I can I can really begin to engineer materials. Uh, I can do things with biological living systems that they have not been built for, but I can direct these systems to do that. And I was just fascinated by this, the possibilities in terms of building and realizing physical examples of what I can model. And and that's something, yeah, that always in the back of my mind, you know, you you have to be able to, at some point, you know, validate the prediction or test them. And that's how models become better, right? I mean, models will fail. That's the point of a model. You want to push it to the limit where it fails. And, and then you can improve it. You collect more data, you have more insight, and you iterate through. And that's how you develop scientific understanding. But yeah, I mean, I think in a nutshell, I answered very, very long for this question, but the, the, the nutshell is really we have very, very, very simple models so far only, and we're missing kind of the collective behavior of, of a system most of the time. Um, we're going to need to go there, and then then we can actually solve these translational engineering challenges much better. Very interesting. Maybe since it's close to the end, I have a few questions for you. Maybe the, the, maybe the last paper, I think you I think you mentioned about the spider web instruction and generative design. Can you tell me about, in your lab, the combination here and what you are aiming by the combination of using here in machine learning? Yeah. Yes, so I mean, for us, the, yeah, it's, like I said earlier, but it's really a way of, of capturing some of the you know incredible complex cross-scale relationships that we have in these biological systems. I mean, relating kind of design decisions that spider makes, right? So if you want to understand, in this particular paper, we, lo we looked at how how spiders build webs and how we can model this process. And so so there's no equation that drives this. And um, there's a lot of behavioral issues there as well, right? So the spider will build the web not just based on the material, it's based on the, you know, the environment perhaps or the prey, the you know, humidity, the temperature. And as I said, we don't really understand fully what's going in there, but it's not something we have a model for, and there's no governing equation behind it. Right? So that's really the difference between a, you know, a quantum chemical reaction where we have these fundamental laws and something like a spider we don't have these laws yet, or maybe they don't exist in the way we want them to look like. So we kind of stuck there. So, so machine learning there is a way of, of really trying to figure out, in, in the particular book, form of machine learning we're using is what's called language models, which are essentially models that can capture, if you wish, the, the, the kind of underlying principles by which the spider actually produces these these networks, these graphs. And um, these are very powerful techniques to um, to study how, you know, learn how a lot of different webs are built and then capture the essence of these construction principles in a model that then you can use as an engineer to make something different. That's what we did in that in that PNAS paper to say, okay, here's a bunch of spider webs and this is how they're built. Um, model learns the relationships and can make new webs. You can make something that looks like a real spider web, yeah, but that's fine, but that's, that's sort of step one. But the really interesting step now is to say, yeah, now I'm gonna take this further and I'm actually going to, um, you know, create something that is does not look like a spider web fully. It's a helical structure or maybe a, you know, a beam design or something, whatever you, you're trying to trying to design. But it uses some of the principles or the underlying microstructures you see in the spider. It's kind of merging um, engineering design, things driven by humans, and things driven by the AI algorithm, which captures the innate kind of construction principle of spiders. And that's a space I love to work in because it really brings together uh, an AI system, a generative AI system, um, with something that's directed by humans, I think these systems are particularly exciting, at least today, um, when you really when you're not letting them run on their own, but you actually interact with them. And you can see this in you know working with AI systems. You can get access to a world that is far beyond the human capability. I cannot draw. I cannot make a graph like a spider can. Right? There's no way I can do this. 
but the AI system can do. But what I what the, what I can do, I can bring in a lot of experience that I have. You know, I can tell the AI system, here's a mathematical equation you should follow, like a helical equation or maybe a you know a tractor equation or some fancy you know, maybe composite design or something. And you can kind of merge a lot of the intelligence and knowledge we have as humans with the kinds of things that AIs can do that we can't do. So so that's kind of like the sweet spot in that paper we're trying to explore is to say, okay, we have a an ability that we have, knowledge we have, and we have an AI system that can do things and let's bring them together and kind of let them let us have some fun and kind of designing things that 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 nature by itself cannot do. And nature, like humans by ourselves, cannot do either on loan. And so let's kind of have this partnership. That's what we did in the, mm-hmm. in the paper. Interesting. Maybe a few questions for you. Uh, since you mentioned in your future dreams, you mentioned about the material you wish to see. Um, may I ask you what other things that may fascinate you, you wish to explore in your lab, maybe? Since your lab had that many interesting, uh, I think, approaches here, maybe from evolution, do you think there's something that's very intriguing that should be consider for a study in the future or still maybe not consider. Yeah, can you tell me about that? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty, I mean, I think my, my overarching, you know, probably the most interesting thing for me is that when you when you put all of these things together, like the insights, the knowledge, the structures, um, you know, what are the what are the universal principles behind it? I mean, it's like maybe an obvious thing to say, but that's what all science really is about, right? It's trying to find, reducing the, uh, you know, explaining really complex things with principles that are simple and can be generalized. And, and that's something that I think is really interesting to explore. Um, I, I think for a lot of these material systems we're looking at, like spider, silk, synthetic materials, polymers, composite, uh, moves, you know, uh, muscles, we do a lot of different things, uh, biomineralization and so on. Um, there's always this... Um, you know, the, the pocket you draw it into, like studying this particular thing, this particular sample of study. Um, and we have to like take that step back, right? And, and try to integrate across. That's my biggest um, you know, goal is really to, once we zoom in, which we did, we have to do, um, to also zoom out again and then and then do this cross translation. That's, I talked a lot about this already, but that's really my biggest uh, future. I, I think in terms of materials, um, I mean, there are a lot of different, if you just, Look around. I mean, in a in the, maybe not in the room here, but outside. I mean, if you go out in nature, I mean, you can find an abundance of materials, and uh, pretty much for, for almost, I would guarantee almost for anything you find, you know, you if you were to look into it, you're gonna find some really intriguing open questions from just from the material side that aren't really explored yet. I mean, we had a paper last year on leaf structures where we we used leaf structures, which is sort of a mundane, uh, you know, everyday thing. But I mean, leaves we have a lot of foliage here in New England, and so in the fall, I was intrigued by that and uh, we, we took a little leaf and we actually designed um, a whole new family of um, architected composite materials out of these leaf structures using a generative AI algorithm at the time and I think this is just an example where you you can just um, you know find a lot of inspiration and problems and challenges you know pretty much no matter, no matter where you look so there's a lot of unknowns but, but at the end of the day I mean you'll have to bring it back to a, a question that matters right I mean you can't just do it for the fun of it I mean but it has to come back to designing a better material or developing some foundational understanding. And that's what I was, so that's what I'm trying to always, try to always do, mm-hmm. is to try to figure out how can I tie this back to the kind of um, the thread that goes through my research endeavors. Um, and I and that's what I also tell my students always, trying to put it back into that bigger picture. And and, and that's that's hard a lot of times, of course, because that's that's the real challenge is how do we, how do we integrate these this, this knowledge, but that's my biggest goal, I think, mm-hmm. I would say. Maybe one question. Uh, I think I forgot to ask last time about the music you produced from a spider whip and inspired by a spider whip, the music. Can you tell me why you do that? Uh, uh, what is the relevance of, of, of that? What are you doing yet? Yeah. So I'm going to try to give you the short answer. So the long answer is basically structure again. So so when you, when you think about structure, my um, exploration of structure is not limited to materials. <laughs> it might be... Kind of confusing, but I, I'm, I'm not just limited to studying materials. Actually, I, I, I am equally interested in in the structure in other systems, and 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 audio, music, sound is it's just another representation of of a structure that's very powerful and and carries a lot of significance in in you know for society, engineering, humanity, um, not just for music but communication and so on. Right. So there's a lot of sort of um, basic questions here, and 
and that's sort of the, the long answer, and I could go on into this much more detail, which we won't have time today. But the the other reason is that um, you know, when one of the one of the passions I have also is to excite people about science and and especially young people. And I I always think that if you you know, spider webs are great for this because everyone has seen one. Right? Kids have seen spider webs all over the place. And when you tell people about, you know, children or, or anyone really in, in the general public, yeah, here's spider webs. This is this is how they're made and, and they're made from proteins. The same proteins that make your heart cells, the same proteins that make your bones. I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> so you, you can tell a story around it and then you get people excited, right? So so yeah, the short answer to this is essentially you get people excited pretty easily about and you can teach them something about science and you make them think about the world around them and 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 and, and you know, I can tell you that no matter the background, I mean, everyone is, has experience that they can relate to what they've been doing in their professional lives. And and again, it's making these connections, right? So you have somebody that worked with, you know, maybe a particular type of material um, or maybe, you know, worked on a particular type of trade. And, and now they realize, oh, there's similarities between the way I work with my particular, I don't know, weaving material and I'm, I'm seeing the spider here or I'm seeing the, right? So, so there's a lot of these interesting analogies. So I get people to think and I get people to, Cross fertilize knowledge, which is something I think is really important, um, and communicate. But then the the music is really a, a sort of another level in this, where you can actually, it's very accessible. You know, where all this I mean, it's kind of a, um, I just say, um, it sounds almost um, it's a it's a platitude. I think is the word for that. Music is a universal language, but it, it is somehow is. I mean, you you can when you when you t- start talking about music, I mean, you can go to any culture in the world, you know, and you can have a conversation about that. And, and, and there's shared histories, there's exchanges that have gone on for thousands of years. Um, and, and I think music is just this general vehicle around which you can have a conversation. So I'm really, my, my role as a scientist and educator is a, is a conversation starter in a way. I mean, I want my students and my, my audience to, to start thinking about it. And I, I don't you know, when you're teaching or you're talking to an audience, you don't talk to them and you want to you wanna engage with them in a conversation, make them think, make them be part of that. And so, yeah, I mean, music is a great way to do that. And when you have spiders and you, you begin to ask the question, what if you took a spider web and you would pick a string like a, like on a guitar or a violin or how would it sound like? Everybody can understand that and everybody can think about it. And, and they say, yeah, that's how we did it. You know, we actually did that. And here's how it sounds like. And it's, it, it opens up this fascinating conversation around that and and is accessible to musicians, artists, creative, smart people, scientists, engineers, people that have never worked on either music or engineering. They everybody has seen a guitar or plucked the guitar, you know. So there's a there's a very entry point to that that's very accessible. And and of course there's also some really fundamental signs, like I said, in the structure of the material and the structure of the sound, the relationship between how so that's sort of the more the deeper question is how the, the sound you make has a structure to it because of the, the organization of, this, of these filaments, how that relates, yeah, again, to the organization of filaments and the function and all the things we talked about earlier in the conversation, they're all related. And and can you kind of move around in the space of information? I'm absolutely fascinated by this. You know, I, I um, yeah, and, and this, this, this is one of those kind of questions that we're going to have to solve is how do we, how do we go from isolating the, uh, the sound of a spider web to visuals, how do we integrate these? They are related. And, and when you integrate this in, in a model, you're going to have a much more powerful understanding that's, that's much more comprehensive. So that's kind of like where I'm going with a lot of the work I do is kind of moving into that, into that field. Yeah.